This is Isandlwana Mountain in KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa. On the 22nd of January 1879, this was the scene of one of the worst defeats ever suffered by the British Army during its long era of colonial wars. But what happened? In today's video we'll explore the topography of Isandlwana and I'll give you an overview of one of the most famous battles in British history. Just so you know, I've done numerous videos on the battle before, so for a full understanding of the events, please try and watch this video in conjunction with my others. You can also download my book on the battle for free via redcoathistory.com. That will fill in any gaps or questions you have. Early in the morning on the 11th of January 1879, Lord Chelmsford's centre column crosses the Buffalo River here at Rourke's Drift to begin the invasion of Zululand. The forces under Chelmsford include the 1st and 2nd Battalion of the 24th Regiment of Foot, as well as N Battery of the 5th Brigade Royal Artillery. There's a squadron of Imperial Mounted Infantry, the 3rd Regiment of the Natal Native Contingent and a number of other small mounted units mainly comprising locally recruited white settlers. It's a powerful force, one of three such invasion columns currently advancing into Zululand. Lord Chelmsford is the overall commander of the invasion forces, but he's here with the centre column. Until recently, he was known as General Frederick Augustus Thysiger, but after the death of his father, he became Lord Chelmsford, and that's how I'll refer to him from now on. On the morning of the 12th, the men of the column have their first major skirmish at the kraal of a local chief called Sihayo. Come here by the orders of the great Queen Victoria. Only a small force of Zulus are present, and the easy victory confirms to British commanders that this campaign would be a walkover. The column advances steadily deeper into Zulu territory. On Monday the 20th of January they set up camp here in the shadow of Isandlwana mountain. Isandlwana is a Zulu word that means it looks just like a little hut and is apparently a reference to the second stomach of a cow. These are some of the key features you need to know for the battle. This is the mountain itself. The camp was laid out here. To the north is the Nyoni Ridge or the Nyoni Heights and this is the Talahani Spur which will be important to our story. East of the camp is the conical kopi or hill. This dry water course is known as the Niagani Donga. All of these features will be mentioned again and are important to the story. So one of the biggest talking points of the battle is that the British made no serious defensive measures. They did not lager the wagons as the Boers would have done, i.e. form them into a defensive perimeter, nor did they make sangers from rocks. An unassailable square of British firepower is a defence which can be formed in a moment. While technically an argument could be made this was not Lord Chelmsford's responsibility, he must ultimately take the blame for this mistake as he had been micromanaging every aspect of the invasion so far. To me, it shows that the British were overconfident and massively underestimated their Zulu opponents. At half past four in the morning on the 21st of January, a strong reconnaissance patrol is sent out to look for the Zulu army. This force is mainly comprised of Zulu auxiliaries and is commanded by Commandant Rupert Lonsdale. In the late afternoon, they discover a large Zulu force right here and engage them. They're forced to bed down for the night, and Lonsdale sends messengers to Lord Chelmsford, implying that the main Zulu impi has been discovered. It's the break that Chelmsford has been hoping for. Desperate to bring the enemy to battle, he splits his force. He leaves camp with the majority of the 2nd 24th, four of his six artillery pieces, the Imperial Mounted Infantry and the Native Pioneer Company. Lieutenant Colonel Henry Poulain of the 1st 24th is now in charge at Isandlwana. His remaining force comprises five companies of the 1st 24th, G Company of the 2nd 24th left behind because they were on picket duty, two seven-pounder guns, around 100 mounted men and approximately 500 auxiliaries of the Natal native contingent. That's around 1,500 men in total. At 7.30 in the morning, gunfire is heard north of the camp. Pickets have spotted Zulu warriors in the area. 
Poulain orders E Company under Lieutenant Charles Cavai to occupy the Tallahani Spur. At approximately 10 a.m., Colonel Durnford and his mounted black troops now arrive from Rourke's Drift. Technically, Durnford is senior to Poulain, but his is an independent command and his priority is to look for and engage the Zulus. He isn't concerned with defending Isandwana itself. He wants to help Lord Chelmsford, who he believes has found the main Zulu Impi, and he quickly deploys his men towards the north and east. So while this was happening, where was the Zulu Impi, the Zulu army? Well, with home field advantage, they have used the terrain to expertly manoeuvre unnoticed to within striking distance of the British camp. They've mustered around 20,000 warriors, hard men, drilled from an early age in the use of their Asagai stabbing spears and their cowhide shields. On the night of the 21st, they'd bivouacked here, in the Engwebeni Valley. It's dead ground that left them unseen by British pickets. Wednesday the 22nd is the day of the new moon. The dead moon, as the Zulus call it. Because of their beliefs, it's considered an inauspicious day to fight. Therefore, their commander, Unsingwayo Kamahole, has decided to rest the warriors and attack the British on the following day. Come look at this, sir! But as we know, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. And around 11.45am, a patrol of Durnford's men make a shocking discovery. As they're rounding up cattle, they crest the edge of the Engwabeni Valley and see the entire Zulu army spread out ahead of them. The Zulus now have no choice but to attack. They quickly deploy into their traditional horns of the buffalo formation and begin to maneuver. Their right horn or right wing comprises the Nokenke, Isanghu, Dududu and Mbube regiments. The chest or centre includes elements of the Ingobamakosi, Mkapo and Mhijo regiments. The left horn also includes some men of the Ingobamakosi, as well as the Undi and Uve regiments. The loins, or reserve, are mainly older men, including the King's regiments itself, the Utulwana. They won't play a big part in this battle, but they will be at Rourke's Drift. As the Zulus begin to close on the camp, messengers rush back to tell Poulain what is happening. Poulain immediately sends Captain William Mostyn's F Company up to the Talahani Spur where they join with Kavai's men. It's now just after midday and Durnford has ran into serious trouble. He's encountered the left horn as it swings south down the escarpment and begins to turn west towards the camp. Durnford's men fire and retire, giving ground grudgingly as they realise the size of the enemy force. Shortly afterwards, a rocket battery under the command of Major Russell is surprised and overrun here at a spot known as The Notch. It's close to the conical copy. These men were actually under Durnford's command and he'd left them behind. They're now slaughtered. The men on the Talahani Spur are now pulled back towards the camp and a firing line is formed facing north towards the Nyoni Heights. The red-coated British infantry are few in number. On the left of the line is Captain Young Husband's C Company. Next to them is Mostyn and Kavai's companies. Next would have been the company commanded by Lieutenant Porteous, the two guns of the Royal Artillery and Captain Wardell's company. On the far right is those men of G Company of the 2nd Battalion, they're under command of Lieutenant Charlie Pope. Each company has a lot of ground to cover and there's at least a metre's gap between each soldier far from the shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder image we have. It's not clear if the Zulu auxiliaries fighting for the British are in the firing line. Given their lack of rifles, it's possible they'd been positioned behind the Redcoats. The Zulu chest now advances down the escarpment and the battle is in full swing. On the British right flank, Durnford and his men have deployed along this donga, the Niagarne donga. They're holding off the Zulu left horn with heavy rifle fire. Amongst those men of the left horn is the Uve regiment. They're the youngest in the Zulu army and they suffer very heavily. At this point, the British still feel they're in control of the battle. Their artillery is firing away and the Zulu chest is pinned down and unable to advance very far. But shortly after 1pm and Durnford's men are once again in trouble. That Zulu left horn is beginning to outflank them and his men are low on ammunition. 
Feeling there is no other choice, Durnford orders his troops to withdraw. This is the tipping point of the battle. Those redcoats, strung out on the firing line, are now in very serious danger. Charlie Pope's company, here on the spot known as Rocky Ridge, are quickly wiped out while trying to fall back on the camp. With perfect timing, the Zulu chess now makes a daring charge. They've been inspired by the words of a chief named Mkozana. He is sadly immediately killed, but his men catch up with the retiring redcoats and the battle descends into a brutal close quarter fight between two sets of equally brave warriors. Stabbing, shooting, clubbing and punching, the survivors fall back towards the camp, but there's no safety for the redcoats there. Poulain is probably killed fighting alongside his men. It's unlikely he died stabbed in his tent as he does in the film Zulu Dawn. Durnford leads a last stand here and dies in the process. All these white cairns mark the mass graves of British soldiers. Captain Younghusband's company fight on, defending the mountain until they run out of ammunition. The survivors then turn to one another, shake hands, fix their bayonets and charge the Zulus. They die like true warriors. It's now around half past two in the afternoon. The serious fighting is now over. The Zulus have won the battle. They cry, Lumini le el Sutu. The Sutu have overwhelmed. Casualties are horrific. Over 1,300 Britons and their allies are dead. Only a handful of them escape the slaughter. We can't say for certain how many Zulus have died, but it's also likely to be around a thousand men, with perhaps twice that many more wounded. With such a limited manpower pool, it's very unlikely the Zulu nation can bounce back from this victory. Well, I hope you enjoyed that, guys. It's a very brief overview of the battle, and as I said at the beginning, you can find out more by downloading my book for free over at redcoathistory.com. Be sure to subscribe and share this video, and I'll see you in the next one.